So, okay, let, let me just go back to the pink noise for a second there and the yeah. distribution and stuff like that. Because we talked about with the correlation that people like pink noise, but we also talked about that, okay, in the probability distribution. And this doesn't, uh, my art, basically an argument that I've been putting forward here in, in different videos is that I was preferring a probabilistic kind of um, random number generation rather than a flat generation like a D20. And we, I was looking at different methods to do that. Mm -hmm. If we're looking at pink noise from the correlation perspective, does that also mean that people tend to like pink noise from the pro in the probabilistic kind of way? Uh, it, do you recommend that then for game design? Well, I mean, again, it's going to depend on what you want to do, you know. And and you know, I I think that yeah, I mean, I would say in general, I think people people like things that are more predictable. Um, I mean, the person that just put up that question, right, about uh, that throws off their weapon balance or whatever it was, was, I mean, I think the underlying thing was that, you know, you're going to get more, maybe you'll get more results that don't kind of match your intuitive reality of what you think should happen. Um, and, you know, this kind of goes to people are, people are bad at randomness, right? So people are bad at generating random numbers. People are bad at recognizing randomness. People are bad at understanding randomness. Uh, and a lot of games, it's harder to do in a board game, but uh, in the video game world, the computers will fudge the random numbers. The software will fudge the random numbers behind the scenes all the time to make you, uh, to make it fit better with what people think is supposed to happen, right? If I'm playing XCOM and I have a 90% chance, 90% 90, 90 chance or a 95% chance to hit, <clears throat> if I miss or I miss, God forbid, I miss twice in a row, I'm going to be like, this thing's broken. There's, you know, this people equate like a 90% chance with certainty. Um, and so actually most of those video games, many of them to avoid these sorts of concerns is um, they will fudge it. So it'll tell you 90%, but behind the scenes, it's really 95% or 96%. It tells you 80%, but it's really 90%. People tend to, um, you know, kind of inflate their chances or put it into a bucket of, yeah, this is definitely going to happen. Um, and that, that gets into, um, the loss aversion book that I talked about also in terms of how people psychologically treat random numbers, you know, people will look at random sequences and say, oh, this isn't, this isn't truly random, even though it's just as random as anything else. Um, so, uh, I think that when you have the, the bell curves, the kind of the bell curve distributions and stuff like that, I think that it tends to fit more in line with, you know, people's expectations sometimes of what probability distribution should look like. So yeah, I, I think that you're onto something there that it gives, gives people more of a sense of control and gives people more of a, a predictable, a predictable feel, but it depends on the nature of the game. I mean, some games are more freewheeling and you want crazy stuff to happen. And some games, you know, are more planning and, you know, you want the, the things a little bit more constrained. Yeah, that's a, it seems like I didn't mean to accidentally through the videos I put out end up being somebody who was anti randomness because I'm not. Uh, but my, while I was trying to say was that my general game design <laughs> philosophy that I'm trending toward now for what I want is to give players a greater sense of control, that greater control that right. you're talking about. Yeah, over there. it's it's a tool. All these things are tools and, and they can all be used you know, in many different ways. And sometimes they're appropriate and sometimes they're not appropriate. So, you know, but nothing is, it, no game is going to be for everybody and no, you know, no tool is always going to be good or always going to be bad. I mean, like, like loss aversion, just getting into that, you know, it, it, uh, is, is the, the idea is that losing something feels way worse than gaining that thing feels good. Um, right. If I, if I give you $20, you feel good. If I take $20 away from you, you feel bad, but you feel worse if you lose the $20 than if you gain the $20. Um, and you can use that in a lot of different ways. And some of them are good and some of them are bad. I mean, like in, in risk or, mon you know, in monopoly, everybody gains stuff. You gain stuff, gain stuff, gain stuff, gain stuff. But then it gets, you lose everything. Everybody loses everything in monopoly except for one person. Um, and, and that's like the worst feeling is getting something and then having it taken away. So that's why Monopoly engenders bad feelings. Now, does that mean that you should never use that, that you should never give your player something and then take it away? It doesn't mean that, but it means that if it, you know that you're going to elicit a strong reaction to somebody. If you're playing D&D &D and you give somebody a pet phoenix, if you later kill their pet phoenix... Oh, you're in trouble. <laughs> that's going to be a problem. 
and you know, same thing with these randomness tools. Um, it's, you know, and, and it's interesting because psychologically they all have their different flavors. I mean, one example, like if you're coming down to a big final battle, right? Let's say we talked about that big dramatic battle, you're rolling your one D20. This is it. This is for all the marbles. I mean, would you rather roll a die for that? Or would you rather flip a card? Would you rather shuffle up a deck of cards numbered from one to 20 and flip over the top card? Which one do you think is more interesting? Which one do you think is dramatic? And do, you, do those two situations make you feel different of flipping the top card of a shuffled deck versus rolling a die? And why yeah, do they, they make you feel different if they make and you feel why? different? Yeah, most, and people I, and I think, make, most people make them feel different. I, I would say that, yeah, that the feeling would be different and why. And that psychology is an important part of the game design. Yeah. What you're trying to yeah. engender. Right. And with most people, it's it's the difference is that the, the, the deck of cards is, it's a fact in the world, right? That, that card on top of the deck is the card on top of the deck. You know, no matter what happens, it's there, right? Your fate has been determined. It's already known. Uh, you just don't know it yet. So, um, whereas if you roll a die, there is no, you know, there is no fate yet. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, people approach that differently, even though mathematically it's exactly the same. So these are kind of the subtle game design things that, that, you know, as a designer, you can take into consideration and you can use to the best effect of what you're trying to accomplish for the goal that you've got. But there's no right or wrong whether a deck of cards is better or worse than a die. Mm -hmm. I think what you said about uh, adjusting, and I didn't know this because I don't play that many video games, but adjusting the probability behind mm -hmm. the scenes based on what they display to the, the player versus what's actually happening is that's probably based on a whole bunch of stuff if not you know research and academia yeah. you do that academically as well that like you're telling a person you got a 70 percent chance of that all this stuff happens and then you ask them do you feel like you had a 70 percent chance <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, right and and then you could match up what is somebody's feeling versus what the reality is and then like you're saying behind the scenes adjust the reality to make sure that people feel the way that you want them to feel that's really interesting to me. yeah yeah blizzard also famously i think they still do it with their in hearthstone when you open uh packs of cards there's a certain chance you get a legendary but for each pack that you don't get a legendary it actually increases your chance behind the scenes of getting a legendary uh, and then when you get it then it resets that counter for you back down to zero so because people oh. were getting really annoyed that they weren't getting legendary cards you know after opening pack after pack after pack after pack so interesting so they, so they kept changing the distribution so to make it a mere cert near certainty that after x number you'll you'll get it at least once that's fascinating because that's entirely digital yeah uh, right so they can do that kind of thing right because right whereas yeah, magic the it, gathering they can't do that they can't and you'll get <laughs> uh, yeah and i remember I, I i played i play magic extremely casually but i remember my friends talking about that like some region or something would not get a certain kind of card <laughs> and that you know and then it's like oh there must be some kind of great conspiracy here or is it that well if you just randomly distribute all these cards around the world some of them might not end up in a place that's not a great conspiracy, but it feels like a great conspiracy against the place. Yep. You know, if you're there in that region. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, and all of that jazz. It really helps a lot. But also, please check out The Cultists, the web series on this channel about modern-day D&D playing Lovecraftian cultists who just want to worship Cthulhu in a world full of people who just don't understand. Season 1 is on the channel now. But also, please check out my YouTube channel. I have over 150 videos on tabletop games and the fantasy genre. If you've enjoyed this video, you might enjoy many of them as well. I look forward to seeing you for them and many more videos to come.